I am a geologist and uh, I focus uh, on impact cratering uh, and it's the most important geological process that you were never told about or rarely told about. Um, can you just tell me by raising your hand how many of you had some lectures on impact cratering before? Okay, Th there were some. <laughs> That's very good, but most of you haven't heard about that much, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a process that is affecting not only the planetary surfaces, but also uh, have shaped the planetary uh, systems and also planetary uh, mantles like it's very important. I hope I will tell you about that in details. In the very beginning, we are going to uh, discuss or I'm, I'm going to discuss and ask you some questions um, about the um, basics of impact cratering. Uh, hopefully it will give you some kind of overview and then we'll move to the uh, topic that I was asked to cover, which is how impact cratering is influencing the, uh, the life and death uh, in our solar system, but possibly also on uh, in other um, uh, solar s planetary systems. Um, yeah, so some of the b because the first the topic is so broad. The second, some of you haven't had any exposure to this topic. So for some of you, especially the geologists that actually had some experience with with impact cratering some of the things may be very basic but please uh bear with me and maybe uh you can use your knowledge to later help your uh colleagues um yeah and some of the issues will be uh, at least in the very beginning in the uh, entry part will be uh, similar to what was just discussed because you know meteorites impact craters there is a lot of overlap but hopefully i will show you uh, and tell you uh, about them from slightly different perspective okay so the first thing you need to know is that oh how much maybe someone knows how much materials is accreted daily on earth from outside earth Anyone knows? Anyone would like to guess? S no. Slightly, <laughs> slightly too much, but uh, about 100 tons daily. Uh, the, the estimates vary quite a lot, but, but this is like a middle ground. So just think about it like the great blue whale a day is falling on Earth. Um, luckily for us, most of this material is in the form of very small pieces. Most of this material is in, in the uh, form of the uh, pieces that are uh, about the size of a grain of, or smaller than a grain of sand, which uh, for us only produce those nice uh, visible effects, but they can have very important um, results uh, in other locations which we are going to cover. However, from time to time we have larger impacts happening. If you look here, can you see that? This white thing? This is called lunar impact flash and this is nothing else than a piece of rock, space rock, hitting the, the moon. From, from time to time we can even observe the crater that have been formed due to this impact. So this is an example of an impact crater that was formed uh, in 2000, uh, we know exactly, March 17th, 2012, I think, so, 13, sorry. Uh, and we have been able to measure the, uh, the diameter of this crater to be 18 meters. Thanks to that, we are able to kind of back calculate the exact or model, not exact, model the size of an impactor as, long, uh, as well as its velocity. So this is one of the sources of information that first tell us that the impact cratering uh, is happening not only, was happening not only in the past, you know, the poor dinosaurs uh, haven't known about that, so now they are not here. Uh, and second of all, uh, we are able to figure out exactly uh, or figure out what is the rate of the current uh, impact flux uh, on, on our surroundings. Um, the, in this case, we are using the entire lunar surface as this amazing uh, kind of uh, experiment that uh, similar to one that was discussed in the morning where we have this gigantic catcher, 
of the planetary bodies that we can observe. Uh, like uh, we were catching the um, um, solar wind um, with those small exposure um, aluminum foils. This time we are using the like entire planetary or um, satellite uh, to to figure out how many of those things are uh, hitting us. However, those kind of things are also hitting the Earth. Uh, the youngest impact crater on Earth was formed in 2007. Like th this is not a long time ago. It is happening all the time. We should know about that. We should care about that. We should be prepared for it. So this one is really, really small. It was about 14 meters in diameter. Uh, it hit uh, a field uh, in Peru, very high up. Most probably if it wouldn't be in Peru, but let's say somewhere in Europe where it's not five uh, kilometers above the uh, ocean level, uh, the asteroid would break up uh, in the air. But in this case, the, the crater was formed. No one was seriously injured. The only person, the, the only creature that was uh, affected was a cow that was the closest, uh, but it survived. It was apparently only in shock. So don't worry about that. Um, but if we'll, uh, you know, calculate all those things like that, that are hitting the, uh, the moon, that are all the things that we can see uh, in the atmosphere due to the set of cameras that are uh, settled up uh, all over the world, we are able to calculate how many things are hitting us. Uh, as you can see, th this was also already shown uh, to some degree uh, here, uh, but I will discuss it in a little bit more detail. So here you can see uh, the mass of the impactor from starting from uh, stuff that is, you know, smaller than th the size of the grain of, uh, of sand, uh, up to the uh, sizes of asteroids that are capable of producing seriously sized uh, impact craters. So here, all of those parts here do not, mostly do not produce impact craters. Those here, the, the black one, uh, the triangles and rectangles, or whatever is the shape, uh, they are producing impact craters. So you can see that we have like a more or less continuous spectrum of uh, stuff hitting us. And again, the larger the, the body, the less often it hits us, which, which is obviously quite uh, good. And right now on Earth, uh, we have about 200 confirmed impact craters. Uh, unfortunately for me, most of the holes in the ground, round holes in the ground are not impact craters. In fact, there is very, very few of them. Um, the largest of them, anyone knows what is the largest impact crater that we know of? Redford uh, in South Africa, it's 300 kilometers in diameter. Luckily for us, it was formed two billion years ago, because if it would be formed right now, we would be in big, big trouble. Anyone remembers what is the size of the um, crater that is associated with the death of dinosaurs? 180. So it was roughly twice as large. This crater, because it's, you know, two billion years old, uh, is extremely uh, eroded. Uh, so there was at least seven kilometers of erosion. So this uh, estimate of, of the size is <laughs> very rough. So it could have been uh, 350 or uh, probably not slightly less. Uh, maybe it's slightly over uh, underestimated. And the smaller, uh, smallest impact crater that we know of, uh, I've already mentioned the 13 to 15 meters in diameter, Karan uh, Kasparu in 2007. So we have entire like a spectrum of impact craters. And now another question, silly question from me. Uh, you can see the map uh, showing the distribution of impact craters by those dots. Uh, and you can see that those dots are distributed extremely unequally. Does it mean that the impact craters are, for example, or asteroids are preferentially uh, hitting some places and not the other ones? For example, in Africa, yes, as you, as you said, some places are much easier to recognize an impact crater than another ones. So this is why uh, we have quite a lot of impact craters here and here and not so many here, because here we have the ugly plants covering beautiful rocks. 
Plus also, you know, uh, impact uh, geologists are not crazy and if they have a chance not to go to the place where every single small creature would to crawl into your eyeball and lay its eggs there, you know, we prefer to, to work in places where it's slightly safer if there is a choice. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's one thing. Why? Uh, Absolutely true. Another reason why there is so many impact craters in the north of Europe and so little in the south of Europe. Any ideas? The older the areas, the, the more impact craters uh, we can see because the more time uh, the, the craters, the impactors had to accumulate. So this is why in the northern part of Europe, where we have uh, the very old rocks at the surface, we have uh, so many impact craters. And in the, uh, in the southern part of Europe, there are so little. And there is also a third uh, reason. Uh, we have so many impact craters in uh, northern uh, America and so few in southern America. Any ideas, except maybe for, you know, the part where there is Amazonian, which we already discussed. But still, th there is a gigantic difference. One of the best uh, parameters that correlate perfectly with the number of craters per kilometer squared is the number of people that are looking for them. So because in America, uh, so, so Northern America, we have so many more impact scientists that are looking for those uh, impact craters, we, we know more of them. This long slide and long discussion is just to tell you that our terrestrial impact crater um, catalog is extremely skewed. It's very, um, it, it lacks absolutely most of the uh, information that was or most of the structures that were um, formed uh, in in the earth and uh, it's th there is definitely more of them looking to be found so uh, you know you can start tomorrow uh, you already also saw this plot or a version of this plot uh, and you can see here the uh, frequency of uh, impacts uh, versus the energy uh, released or the asteroid diameter which are scaling uh, together and you can see that the uh, impactors that are you know a couple of meters in diameter that are giving you those nice bolides uh, can be expected uh, up to a couple of times every year however the chick slope uh, so the one that killed the dinosaurs should not be formed more often than uh, once uh, in about 100 millions of years. Uh, so that's a good uh, good news for us. And uh, in the in the moment, in the, on the next couple of slides, I will be showing you effects that each of those uh, sizes of of uh, asteroids that hit us have uh, on our life. So. If we are this uh, millimeter to centimeter diameter, we are just forming those nice things on the sky. Uh, this is happening all the time and we should be, you know, very happily thinking about those things, except if we are in space. Okay. Uh, this is a very serious problem uh, because the uh, even very small pieces uh, travel at speeds, hypervelocity speeds that are uh, about on average uh, 15 to, uh, to 20 kilometers per second, which means that they are much more, much, much more energetic than if you would shoot into your uh, spaceship uh, from a, like a sniper gun. This is a very big problem. And this is a very big problem, not only to, you know, survival of, uh, of us if we want to um, explore moon, explore space, but also a problem uh, for a lot of space uh, science that is being done. For example, uh, if we'll not account for all those uh, micrometeorites and larger meteorites, which are obviously less likely, we are not able to calculate, uh, uh, we are not able to, for example, measure um, the uh, very far uh, planetary systems because uh, that, that need to be measured in uh, infrared because this requires a lot of, you know, uh, heating from the uh, high shielding from the heat. Uh, and if the heat shield will be damaged by this kind of stuff, we have a problem. So those kind of things need to be taken into account. Uh, and they were already causing some problems. So for example, here is a uh, quite famous example of uh, a micrometeorite uh, that hit or 
a crater, a uh, micro crater that was formed uh, on the handle uh, on the outside of the International Space uh, Station that uh, very unlucky place because this is just very close to the place where they are getting out of the International Space uh, Station and, uh, you know, going around outside to do whatever they do. Uh, and the uh, because of this this crater, the the glove uh, of one of the astronauts uh, became uh, not fully um, sealed. Uh, luckily, it was very close to the entrance, so he managed to to get in. But you know, th this shows that this is a very big problem. Uh, the craters, even those really really small craters, are very very similar in kind of general shape to the to the uh, larger craters, and they have very especially if they are made in. Uh, metal material, they have very sharp edges. So this is also a problem that we should care about. Okay, uh, this is something that was just shown during the previous uh, lecture. Uh, this is a uh, fall of the meteorite in 92. Uh, the, uh, this was about one uh, meter in diameter. Uh, the, there was no crater except if you want to count that. Uh, the and this, this is the usual uh, results that we have. The funny thing is that we have never uh, noticed any person killed by a fall of a meteorite uh, of this size. Apparently that there were some, there was some dog killed, uh, and, uh, but, but no people. Okay, larger one, this was already discussed in details, 20 meter in diameter um, asteroid if it's stony asteroid, it will not make an impact crater. If it's an iron, this would end up uh, making an impact or could have made an impact crater. Uh, and here is, you have uh, one of the, again, uh, most famous examples of Tunguska, fifth, about 50 meters in diameter uh, body uh, that flattened forest uh, on the diameter of uh, about 30 kilometers. So a large area in Siberia was just flattened. Um, interesting thing is that never even a small piece of the extraterrestrial material was found, even though a lot of people were looking for it, uh, which kind of suggests to us that uh, either aliens um, <laughs> or, uh, or uh, the uh, cometary body, or at least a body with a lot of, uh, with a very uh, low strength uh, of material uh, and quite a lot of the uh, kinetic energy, but not much actual mass that could be detected later on after the, um, after the fall. This exactly, or more or less, the exactly sized uh, body have been have produced a crater that is 1.3 kilometers in diameter. This one is uh, located in Barringer, in Arizona called Barringer Crater about uh, 50,000 years ago. So you can see here that two different bodies that had most probably similar sized had dramatically different effects that we can uh, see right now uh, on our planet. And of course, the most famous uh, uh, impact crater that killed dinosaurs uh, was about 10 kilograms, uh, 10 kilometers in diameter. So why do bodies that have, you know, the 10 kilometers is, is a, you know, significantly sized body, but it's nothing compared to size of the Earth. Why did it have such an effect? It's all because even though it's small, as I said, they are very, very fast their speeds are really really high they have a lot of kinetic energy when we remember that the kinetic energy is uh, proportional to mass but proportional squared to the velocity and uh, masses can vary quite a lot you know again we start from sizes uh, smaller than the grain of sand uh, we can go to uh, asteroids kilometers in diameter uh, the Densities matter, but mostly to those lower um, impact craters if the asteroid is large enough 
it, it, it became less important. But the thing that is really important is the velocity. So the velocities that uh, the bodies have when they are hitting the Earth are from about 11 to up to 70 uh, kilometers per second. Uh, the the average for the asteroidal body is about 20 kilometers per second. Uh, if you have a cometary body, uh, you can get, you know, higher up to the 70. So amazing amount of uh, kinetic energy. How much n squared? Uh, how much is it exactly? Just to give you like a, you know, <laughs> understanding. So here is the uh, distance that is covered by uh, distance traveled in one second by those uh, objects. Uh, here's the velocity uh, that they have in kilometers per hour. So something that we are more uh, used to. Uh, and here, so in one second, the fastest person alive uh, will cover 11 meters. The fastest car and the one that is like just driving straight on the flat surface will cover uh, 350, uh, 330 meters. Uh, very, well, quite normal uh, plane, uh, about one kilometer, but once it's already quite high up. Uh, the highest rocket ever launched, the one that went to the Pluto system, was able after you know, after it was already traveling to, to go 10 kilometers per second, an absolutely average normal asteroid is able to cover 20 kilometers per second. It's amazing amount of uh, kinetic energy. And this is because, and this is why it has very, um, the impact of asteroids with this amount of kinetic energy is causing uh, results that are very different from what we usually uh, see um, in, in geology. Th this is totally different. So here is a numerical modeling uh, of a body that was, uh, that is about the size that uh, caused formation of the Chicxulub crater, that the one that killed the dinosaurs. You can see here there is, uh, a, it's calculated up to uh, minus uh, 40, 30 uh, kilometers. Um, this is done by hydrocodes. Uh, so the code that is, over, is calculating how the material behaves in very extreme situation of this kind of impact. You can see here that 12 seconds after an asteroid hit, we end up with a hole in the ground that is about 15 kilometers deep. And it's the, the walls are practically uh, vertical. Our entire impactor is just gone. It not even vaporized, it, it became plasma. This is why especially for those large impact craters, we do not have and we don't have impactors that that made the uh, the crater. OK, the, there are some people that are claiming they do. Maybe they do, but it would be rather something accompanying, not the main body that hit the the earth at this point. That would be totally, totally gone. What does it mean that we have this kind of hole in the ground? Any ideas? Can it stay like that? No, <laughs> it cannot. It's way too deep to be stable. And this is why, uh, or partially this is why, the rocks are continuing to kind of behave like a liquid, it, as if it was uh, flowing. The, if the crater is not too large, or depending on the size of the planetary body where the uh, asteroid hit, uh, for example, this is a simple crater on the moon that is about uh, 1.5 uh, kilometers. Um, it stays more or less like that. So it has this classical uh, bowl shape. The material just uh, that was thrown out from the crater just lands and it's done. However, if the crater is large, really large, it continues to bounce back. And because of that, the impact craters that are really, really large are not so deep because the, the rocks just couldn't uh, support this this way. They are not strong enough. And because of that, the uh, Chicxulub impact crater is not this kind of bowl shaped thing that, that you could uh, imagine. It's actually the um, shape like sombrero. 
with a material that is uh, that has this central uplift, a central hill in the very uh, in the very middle of, of the crater. However, if the craters are really, really, really large, uh, you can end up not with a single uplift, uh, as you can see here, but rather with a, a set of centrally uh, adjusted mountain ranges. This is a Orientale Basin that is located on the moon. Uh, and uh, luckily for us, it's located like at the side that we, well, we see just part of it. It's not in the back uh, side of the moon, but it's on the side. Just imagine what if you would see uh, every day on the sky, you would see this gigantic kind of ball eye looking at you. So impact craters do affect our life. Um, as I said, the, because of the amazing uh, amount of energy, uh, kinetic energy that we have, the impact crater that is uh, 1.4 kilometers in diameter, here is a, a gigantic museum uh, with a gigantic American uh, parking lot uh, just for scale, was formed by a piece that was just 50 meters in diameter. Okay, so what kind of effect does it cause for, for the rocks that it affects? As I said, the closer we are to the impact point, the, the worse it is, obviously. So the uh, parts that are the closest to the impactor, impact point uh, are being vaporized. Uh, then there is a layer that is melted. And then you have the shock metamorphosed, uh, metamorphosed uh, section. The further away you get, the less rocks are messed up, but you can still uh, recognize the fact that the uh, impact crater happened. So here you can see how the rocks, uh, how the impact metamorphism is uh, compared to the metamorphism uh, in normal life, you can see here the plot of pressure con uh, versus temperature, uh, and the normal, all the normal geology, including the you know very deep down geology that we have on Earth, is happening within this uh, this area of about uh, you know one uh, maybe couple of uh, uh, gigapascals uh, and temperatures up to about thousand uh, degrees because you know if you get above thousand degrees you melt your rock so you kind of lose the information. However, the uh, conditions uh, that we have during the impact creating process are very, very different and are marked here with this red part. So the, uh, the pressures, even in those really quite small impact craters can be and are above five uh, gigapascals uh, and can get up to uh, 100 gigapascals. Uh, and it causes a set of very characteristic uh, and atypical effects in your rocks. So if you get your rock uh, and you can check if inside these rocks are characteristic um, um, minerals uh, or characteristic features that can help you to recognize this uh, impact crater. So for example, here you have shutter cones that are presented here. Those are quite uh, low pressure features. You can see that they are those um, uh, strange looking conical uh, features. It's very hard to um, describe it, but it's easy to recognize it once you have seen uh, many of them. This one is uh, from a quite small impact crater in uh, Germany uh, called Steinheim. And they are formed, as I said, uh, about uh, 5 GPA. If you have the higher pressures, you, for example, form a specific uh, features within crystalline lattice of quartz uh, or zircon. Uh, they are called planar deformation features. They generally look as if the, your uh, quartz crystal was just cut into very small uh, lamella that are totally uh, 
changed, like the, the crystallis, la, crystalline lattice uh, of the mineral just collapses. Uh, we don't know exactly how they are formed. It's kind of similar to the, uh, to the uh, controls. Uh, there is a very funny saying that the controls are formed by control forming processes, uh, kind of similar with planar deformation features. Uh, you know, we, we know they are there. We can uh, describe them. We can use them in many different ways. We don't know exactly how it works, except that it's uh, due to the passage of the shock wave through the um, through the rocks. Um, if we increase the pressure even higher, we have the diapletic glass, which is the um, minerals that are within your rock uh, look exactly the same as if they were, you know, normal average minerals, normal average sandstone, for example, except that their uh, crystal lattice is totally messed up. So if you will look at them uh, under the cross polarized um, um, light, uh, it will be totally dark. Um, also, if you increase the pressure even higher, you can produce some high pressure versions of your minerals. So for example, out of quartz, you can form caesite or uh, stishovite. If you reach gen specific um, values of the uh, of pressure. In the past, the crater rate formation much was much higher than it is right now, luckily for us. So here you can see the time before present. We are here right now. Here is the cumulative number of craters in the past. This plot was made mostly based on the Apollo uh, era uh, rocks and uh, excavations. So we can see here that in the past the rate was many times higher than it is right now. However, the definition, like the exact number is really shaky. And the, you know, the longer you look at that, the more shaky it is. And it's very scary because the only way we have right now for dating all planetary surfaces in our solar system uh, is based on crater dating. Anyone knows uh, what is the crater dating? Yes, you can try explain. Exactly, exactly. It's the same thing as with, you know, the difference between the uh, Europe, uh, southern and northern Europe. The more, the older the surface, the more crater, uh, craters it had because it was exposed to, to the situation uh, of potentially getting hit uh, more often. So in, in short, you count the number of craters, you compare it to the known number of uh, craters uh, of a dated surface that you dated in different way, and voila, you can determine the age of the, of the crater. Very easy. Uh, so here you have an example. Uh, the, the place here, you can see that it's, it's a young flow, uh, lava flow uh, on the moon. And you can see that there is definitely less impact craters than on this uh, older uh, surface. Um, if you calculate that again, and you compare it to the known values, you can determine the ages of all planetary surfaces. This is how we do it. However, the problem is that we don't know exactly uh, very well how this production uh, function looks like. There are very big errors uh, related to the fact that, for example, one of the impact craters, uh, the, uh, the one that is kind of bounding this part uh, of, the, of the production line, uh, is based on a hunch and, and nothing else. Like, uh, is based on the fact that someone uh, grabbed a rock that someone else interpreted as if it could have been formed from and impact craters hundreds of kilometers uh, away. So just not to say that it doesn't work, it does, but the ages that are sometimes provided based on this method uh, should be treated with a large grain of salt. Here you can see a, a map with all the impact craters and uh, impact uh, deposits that we know of. Uh, and you can see that the uh, ages that are shown on this plot uh, of the craters are not very kind of representative uh, to the um, 
to the history uh, of the earth so here you can see the age uh, the now is here and here you have the number of the impact craters what can we see here nothing <laughs> nothing we have nothing for uh, that is um, older than uh, 2.3 uh, billion years while uh, just a moment ago i showed you this plot here so what's wrong we don't have information about that this is why to get information about this very early uh, solar system bombardment we would have to go to um to other planetary bodies that do not have as uh, um, intensive geology, let's call it in this way. However, we have something that is called impact ejecta and deposits. And this is a um, situation where we do not have an impact crater, but we have some rocks that have been affected by the, uh, by the f impact. Event. So here, this is one of the uh, nice examples. Can you see those those small balls here? Do do you? It kind of looks similar uh, to controls, <laughs> but those are not controls. Uh, those are impact spherules uh, that are formed if you have the um, your material that was hit by an impactor that is being melted. Uh, or vaporized and then condenses and forms those structures here. Based on that, you can see that there were in the past impactors and they had to be really gigantic because this size of the, uh, of the impact spheral had to be produced by uh, impacts that were of uh, like as large as Redafort, those 300 kilometers or larger gigantic impact craters we can see that we have some data on them but not much and we can see that uh, not all of those here that are uh, are you know those gigantic indicators of those gigantic uh, uh, impactors but those those really old ones are all the features like that and what else can we see here every year there is a paper that is saying yes during the or the vision there was an impact sp spike and then there is another paper that is saying no there wasn't any uh, sometimes they are being published in the same uh, journal which is very funny i think uh, so the idea is that uh, at some point during the or the vision there was uh, an event uh, in the uh, asteroid belt that disrupted the the uh, situation so most probably two large uh, asteroids collided with each other, uh, which caused an increased rate of the impactors coming to Earth. We don't know exactly yet if it's true or not because of the problems with the preservation of rocks that we see on Earth, but this is something that uh, should and is studied. Okay, so right now I will very quickly uh, go through the information about the, uh, how impact craters are impacting the life. Some of those things have been already discussed uh, during the previous uh, lecture, so I will try to move quickly through them and focus on the ones that uh, I care most about, which is the, the deadly parts. So here, uh, first of all, the formation of our own planet is due to the gigantic impact. We don't have an impact crater <laughs> from this event, obviously, because uh, it uh, most probably remelted either large part or uh, entire Earth uh, and most probably uh, entire Moon. Uh, however, we can also, like, there is a good reason to think that without this particular uh, impact, uh, we would not be here. I mean, there could have been some microorganisms uh, on the Earth, uh, even without the Moon, but we, kind of more complex organism, we wouldn't make it. Any ideas why? Anyone heard about that? Think about the Mars. Mars doesn't have a Moon. Mars has very high different, uh, differences in the uh, orbital uh, inclination. We do not move too much uh, as a planet, and thanks to that, our uh, climate is pretty stable. On Mars, it changes a lot. So most 
th there is a reason to think uh, that the more stable climate is uh, helping us to, to survive better. Uh, second thing that we owe to impactors maybe uh, is that delivery of water uh, as it was discussed uh, previously uh, this theory was more popular in the past right now I think it's kind of fading uh, so in the past uh, we thought that most of the water was kind of far away in the solar system and then it was brought to our part of the solar system by impactors however the uh, analysis of the uh, isotopic uh, fingerprinting uh, of ISIS showed that uh, most probably the um, the water was either brought by other uh, asteroids, so not far away uh, from the edges of the solar system, but rather from uh, nearby areas. However, you know, it's still being uh, discussed. Next thing is the organics in meteorites. Uh, I'm sure it will be discussed uh, more. There is some of the meteorites uh, have a lot of organics. So, for example, this is Merchinson's. Uh, and I think the total uh, carbon oh, is 2%, uh, at least in this part here. Uh, but all other building blocks that are required for the formation of organics uh, are in the meteorites and were probably brought by, by meteorites to Earth. Some of the meteorites also can uh, include a lot of uh, more complex uh, organic um, particles, which I, I'm sure a lot of you uh, know more about than I do. However, my point is that most probably uh, a lot of those organics that could have been formed, you know, before a particular rock arrived on Earth were most probably either damaged or seriously uh, changed during the impact uh, event. Even though most of the particles that arrive on Earth are very small, most of the mass is arriving as lar parts of larger uh, particles. And those, those larger asteroids would be destroyed, uh, kind of remelted, and the, um, the organics would be seriously damaged. Um, not to say that it, it's not impossible to deliver, some obviously we have measured that in uh, Merchinson's, for example, but but it's not uh, like most of it would be damaged. However, some experiments uh, are suggesting that the, the shock waves that are going through the atmosphere can produce some of the very interesting uh, um, materials, organic particles that we care about. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, two-way system and we don't know yet exactly if the most of the material organic material was damaged or produced in this way however we know for sure that the impact craters are very nice location for life if the life already exists uh, it produces a lot of habitable niches uh, which may or may not be important for uh, past earth but it's definitely very important uh, for mars especially if we are talking about kind of extending potential uh, habitability of, of the red planet because um, impact craters especially those large impact craters are associated with very with significantly long-lived hydrothermal systems uh, even in places where you know they those kind of uh, situation would not be possible without the, the impact itself. The sources of the heat uh, are mostly freeways. So the, uh, the impact melt, which is, you know, material melted directly by the uh, compression, decompression of the shockwave at the impact. Uh, the impact melts can be very, very thick, can have, you know, kilometers in diameter um, or, or in thickness, uh, and they can stay uh, warm for millions of years, uh, especially for those really, really large uh, impact craters. Uh, they, you know, after they are formed, they kind of behave very similarly to uh, like uh, the volcanic um, uh, impact, uh, volcanic melts. Um, however, yeah, however, they are also uh, kind of warmer because of the uh, geothermal gradient because if you 
remember this uh, numerical modeling that I shown in the very beginning within cup within a minute or maybe two minutes literally 120 seconds you can end up with rocks that used to be at the depths of uh, tens of kilometers being just bounced to the surface which means that they had a certain temperature due to the uh, geothermal gradient and then they are ex like at the surface which they are warm, that's the point. Uh, and uh, the third one is the uh, kind of shockwave heating, which is especially important if you have highly porous rocks. So because of that, we know that on Earth, a lot of um, impact crater rocks are much nicer places to live uh, than locations that have not been uh, hit by a uh, uh, by an asteroid. So here you have an uh, example of all the nice things that live in the uh, rocks that are in the in the crater that the name I just forgot because of course uh, but it's very high in the north uh, you know the arctic desert um, and the best place to live is is in the crater because it's the rocks are much more porous, which means that all the microbes can just find nice habitable niches inside the rocks. Second of all, there's plenty of glass. And you probably all know how tasty glass is if you are a microbe. Uh, there often are crater lakes inside the, the you know, the, there's a hole that there will be a crater lake very often, which means more water, which means uh, kind of more moist uh, situation and there is also a lot of uh, alteration minerals that also may be a very nice place to live for microbes so this is why we have those kind of uh, habitable niches on earth but uh, they are and uh, obviously modeling but also uh, measuring the and the dating the alteration ages or different alteration sequences uh, is showing us the uh, the duration of the uh, hydrothermal system for the large impact craters like the chick slope or you know couple of hundreds uh, kilometers uh, can be millions of years which is very significant maybe not for earth again we have a lot of other nice places to live for microbes um, due to the plate tectonics, but definitely extremely important for Mars. And uh, the everyone's favorite topic, which is uh, lithopanspermia. Uh, anyone knows what's lithopanspermia? Potential, very potential, nothing proven. Potential possibility that the, the um, organisms may be transferred naturally from one planet to another. We don't have any proof for that, so this idea is just something that is being tested in order to see if any of the steps that are necessary can be excluded to, see, to say, no, this is not possible. For now, uh, you know, we haven't found anything that would, should definitely uh, allow us to exclude this possibility. So first, the ejection. We know that it's possible because we have pieces of meteorites from other planetary bodies. So, for example, we have meteorites from Mars. We know that it's possible to move material from Mars to Earth. It would be slightly more complicated to do it the other way around, but it's not impossible. Uh, there is a very cool paper that is uh, found pieces of Earth on the Moon within the rocks that were brought to Earth by Apollo mission. So we know that, you know, this transfer is possible. Uh, it's all uh, because of the impacts of larger planetary bodies that need to hit the, the other surface uh, at the very specific uh, speeds and uh, inclinations. Uh, about 30 degrees uh, is, uh, um, is the most probable. Uh, and then they can eject it to the outside of the gravitational um, sphere um, influence of, of these planetary bodies. Most of those rocks, unfortunately, end up uh, burned up uh, on the sun, um, but some of them can reach other planetary bodies, including uh, us. So ejection, definitely possible. But second question is, can those kind of microbes survive the ejection? Uh, so very evil people are spending quite a lot of time 
torturing those poor microbes in very, very brutal way by sending uh, shock waves uh, through the rocks that are kind of um, grown, um, the, the microbes are growing within the rocks, uh, the rocks are being shocked uh, experimentally uh, with different methods, uh, and then they check if the uh, microbes survive or not. And apparently, not all types of microbes, that, but there are types of microbes that were tested that are able to survive up to the pressures of like absolutely crazy um, couple of tens of GPI. Uh, places where you form those uh, diaplectic glass or even coesite. Th this is absolutely crazy. And um, it definitely means that the, the material that was here can be first ejected and then if there are any microbes, then can, they can potentially uh, survive ejection process. The second thing is that go, they have to, oh, and here is the example of the infamous uh, Martian meteorite with potential microbes that you have probably uh, heard about in the past. So the transfer, we know thanks to the fact that we have those meteorites from Mars, we know that it's possible to deliver them to Earth. Uh, and the transfer, but the largest problem with the transfer is that uh, the potential microbes need to be exposed to the um, cosmic environment for quite a long time. So the transfer is uh, taking a couple of tens to a couple of hundreds of thousands of years at minimum. The microbes need to be able to survive that and obviously we cannot test that because we don't have all this time to to wait for the result of the experiment. Uh, there are some experiments with the uh, you know increased uh, irradiation doses and so on but it's not exactly um, it, you know, it simulates part of the process, but not entire process. So this is the thing that we are, uh, for now, we are able to say that the, uh, some of the, definitely some of the microbes, but even some of the more co uh, complex organisms like lichens and fungi are able to survive a couple of years in space. Um, we don't know yet if they are able to survive longer than that. Um, Obviously, they are, you know, they are not doing great. <laughs> uh, so the uh, survivability is decreasing quite a lot, but, but it's not impossible, especially if those organisms are not exposed to directly to the uh, to space, but are kind of embedded uh, deeper within the rocks, wh which is not impossible. First thing, they have to survive the landing. So uh, this is uh, one of the examples of rocks that uh, were uh, exposed at the edge of the of a rocket and then sent back uh, to earth to check how uh, how rocks that are uh, being uh, th that have some organism inside will behave uh, when they are going back uh, to earth uh, and apparently some of them were badly melted which is not very you know surprising we know what happens to meteorites when they enter the uh, the atmosphere you just heard about that part of that uh, is just being melted um, there is a fusion crust being formed one like looks like that it's you know couple of tens of uh, degrees even more however if we are just a little bit lower than that, we are really cool and fine. And we can survive if we are obviously, you know, microbes, not, not we can survive. If we are microbes, we can survive this trip, even without the space rocket. So yeah, it's, you know, Lita Panspendermia is still a very wild theory, but for now, it looks as if it's not impossible. It may, uh, be shown that it's impossible in the future, but for now it's still a matter of, uh, of study. So right now I'm going to talk quickly about my favorite topic, which is uh, being killed by an asteroid. Um, and I will start with uh, someone that we should be very grateful to, which is uh, obviously the well, um, Bruce Willis, yes, Bruce Willis, which saved us from the asteroid that was 1000 kilometer in diameter, which would be indeed very bad asteroid because it would create a crater that is about the same size as uh, 
uh, as Africa. Not great, uh, depending on how it would hit, uh, it could change the length of day uh, by about 30 minutes. So it's nice that uh, Robin will that Bruce Willis, thank you, <laughs> um, saved us. But even with this size of the asteroid impact, it's very unlikely that we would have like a full impact sterilization. It's really like imp unless entire planetary surface is remelted or large part of planetary surface is remelted, it's really hard to, uh, to kill everything. Again, I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about microbes <laughs> surviving. Sorry, <laughs> we would be doomed. Um, why, why is it? Why the impact sterilization is so hard? Uh, mostly because it's very heterogeneous process. So for example, here you uh, can see um, a rock uh, or a cross section through an impact crater, a uh, pretty large impact crater with a lot of rocks that are here partially um, affected. But those rocks here, the microbes in this location would be fine. We know that from those uh, impact experiments with torturing the, the impact craters, they would be fine. Those, crate, those uh, rocks here would be maybe uh, shocked to maybe 10, uh, maybe locally 20 uh, GPA. It, it should be fine. The parts would be indeed quite uh, heated to quite large high temperatures and this is much more dangerous and hard uh, for the microbes to, to handle. Of course, you know, a couple of hundred uh, degrees may be possible, but uh, the degrees, the, the temperature that is melting rocks, not so easy. So here you can see a piece of a suevite, which is a rock that was formed by an asteroid hitting the earth in Germany about 14, year, uh, 14 million years ago that is, uh, used to be a very nice piece of normal uh, carbonaceous uh, rock, uh, so um, CaCO3. Um, uh, yes, thank you, limestone. <laughs> yes, it was a nice piece of limestone and then it was just messed up by the impactor. Um, the, uh, it was just changed into uh, like a rock flower that was partially glued together by pieces of the uh, of melt that you can see here as those darker blobs. Um, also, you know, other rocks were intermixed, so it's a very complex rock. The point is that, you know, here you can see the rock that was heated above 1000 degrees roughly and here you can see rocks just next to it that were much lower in temperature and this is the worst you know worst part uh, of those of this entire large impact crater 24 kilometers in diameter only very small parts of this those rocks here would be kind of hard to survive for microbes all other parts here would be easy so Impact sterilization is very hard. Uh, why then the, um, this impactor caused so much trouble? First of all, it did not sterilize the earth. Yes, we are here. Uh, even some, you know, the, the chickens are here, so not all dinosaurs died. Um, but still, it caused quite a lot of mess in our um, system, biological system, uh, one of the largest, one of the largest uh, dying off was definitely caused by, by, by this impact. Um, there were creatures that were definitely affected by the direct strike. So if you were somewhere here, you're a dinosaur somewhere here, you were very lucky because you died instantly. You were, um, up to a couple of uh, maybe uh, up to 2000 kilometers from the point of impact uh, you would be just uh, cooked very quickly there is a gigantic fireball very similar to what you can see uh, if there is uh, an atomic bomb exploding uh, maybe 1.5 thousand kilometers from the point of impact so so very very quick, <laughs> easy death. Uh, if you are further away, you end up with the shockwave uh, collapsing your lungs, especially dangerous if you are a large animal. Smaller ones may be less affected. Uh, there is a gigantic uh, uh, winds, uh, so you can just get 
you know, be hit uh, with a branch or something, you know, there are options uh, of dying. And of course, you can be just hit with a piece of uh, material that was uh, ejected from the impactor uh, at the uh, at this location. However, you know, it, it sounds bad, but it, it did not affect the entire globe. So what happened? Climate change. <laughs> What killed dinosaurs? Climate change. But obviously not dinosaur produced climate change, uh, but asteroid produced climate change. Uh, the, uh, the thing that happened was to, you know, the tsunami, yes, yeah, not great. The, uh, the fireball, um, only very close to the impact site in the past, there was a theory that maybe they're re-entering the, uh, of the ejecta that was, um, <sighs> launched during the impact uh, and for example produced those uh, impact spherules could have heated the uh, the air uh, the atmosphere uh, sufficiently to produce uh, global uh, wildfires most probably not except maybe in some extremely unlucky places that were anyway very susceptible to uh, to forest fires but Probably not the problem. The problem was the fact that, first of all, like uh, someone mentioned, there was a lot of dust that was dumped into the atmosphere, which uh, just blocked the uh, the sun and caused very rapid uh, change in the climate. Second of all, uh, there was a lot of both CO2 and uh, uh, sulfur um, uh, pumped into the atmosphere, which means that it just put the entire global system into the very uh, unstable situation, which means that the dinosaurs just could not cope with the quick pace of, of, the, um, of the climate changes. What about slightly smaller asteroids? So here is the uh, site uh, at the Reese crater. So one that is related to this nice rock here that you will be able to to look at uh, later on the uh, risk crater is uh, was caused by about uh, one kilometer in diameter asteroid it's uh, about uh, 24 kilometers in diameter uh, 14 million years so a long time ago and you can see here this very small black thing here and again this is a piece of wood that was, uh, you know, if, if you have a trunk that was cut like that, th this is a part of trunk, tree trunk, that was just uh, swooped into the entire mess of the, uh, of the crater because the entire thing was covered in, again, a couple of minutes with a couple of hundreds of material that was not there before. So, it's very, it's very locally, very dangerous, locally meaning, you know, large part of Central Europe, because, for example, we can see still find pieces of this nice Bavarian location here, find those pieces here in Wrocław, where I live, or very close to Wrocław. Those things are called tectites. Those are pieces of melted rock that was ejected from the uh, from some of the impact craters and traveled very far away. Again, you could get hit by those things and burned very um, significantly because this was very melted rock at the time of ejection. And even the, the crater, pretty small crater that you can see here, the 1.3 kilometers in diameter uh, Berenger crater in Arizona was again uh, causing similar effects uh, as I just discussed for Chick Sloop but in smaller scale. So again, the fireball up to about 10 kilometers, the um, collapse of lungs due to the passage of the shockwave uh, up to uh, 20 something kilometers, very hard wind. So the smaller the impactor, obviously the less um, large area that is uh, affected. So what about the uh, craters that are the most often forming on Earth? This is actually the, my favorite topic of the studies, uh, which are formed uh, once every century, once every couple of thousands of years, very often, geologically speaking. So, for example, here you have uh, the only Polish uh, example of uh, an impact crater uh, called Morasco. It's uh, located in central Poland. The largest uh, impact, you can see here a couple of different uh, 
round holes in the ground. Those are all impact craters that were formed at the same moment because the asteroid was crossing through the atmosphere and then uh, disintegrated into smaller pieces that uh, hit the Earth at practically the same time. The largest of those uh, craters is 100 meters in diameter, but as I said, th there are a couple of other ones uh, about uh, 40 meters in diameter and so on. Uh, and uh, what was done just a couple of years ago uh, was a very detailed study of the material that is collected, that was collecting uh, itself uh, within a lake that is located only five kilometers from the point of impact. Uh, and we know the age of the crater here. And you can see that there is this, this is just part of the data, but I didn't want it to, to just put all of the palynology and stuff like that. But there isn't much change. The point is that this impact crater, formation of this impact crater of this size was not really seen far away from the impact point. Similar thing uh, is related to Kali crater, which is very similar uh, in size. Again, about uh, the uh, located in Estonia, uh, the largest crater is about 100 meters in diameter. There are other ones uh, smaller around it. Uh, and for a very long time, it was thought that the uh, analysis that was done in the uh, bog that is uh, uh, located about eight kilometers north from the point of impact was showing this dramatic change in the um, in how the um, environment looked like uh, due to the impact. However, uh, in the end, uh, we figured that the date was not selected well uh, for this, this analysis. And we, again, we don't think that this size of an impactor is causing large death zones around it. So yay for us, because <laughs> they happen very often. However, it doesn't mean that it doesn't cause death and destruction. It's just it's very localized. So here you can see the uh, again the Kali craters uh, and the um, DEM uh, digital elevation model of the of the largest crater and we were digging here uh, in the proximal ejecta blanket. So the material that was thrown out from the crater during its formation. Uh, this is just one of our um, outcrops. And what we found was pieces of dead bodies. We found dead bodies of organisms that were killed by an asteroid. Some of the dead bodies were just a couple of centimeters in diameter. Some of them were slightly larger. All of them were mostly spruce. <laughs> uh, so the uh, just uh, trees that were growing nearby and uh, had a very bad day uh, f uh, three and a half uh, thousand years ago because they were hit by an asteroid and all of them died at the same moment. The interesting thing is that if you study uh, this charcoal, study the dead bodies, you can figure it out figure out in which uh, conditions uh, the charcoal was formed. So what was the conditions within the proximal ejecta blanket uh, at the time of formation? And apparently, first of all, this charcoal is very different from the charcoal that is formed during the forest fires. Uh, second of all, it's uh, quite low in temperature. So if you do some experiments, um, you can figure it out that the temperature of the proximal ejecta blanket was up to uh, about 500, 600 degrees only. Uh, interesting thing is that apparently uh, all of the, or most of the impact craters uh, all around the world uh, have similar features. So this is what you should expect from those small impact craters. You do not have to evacuate, you know, hundreds of kilometers or, you know, tens of kilometers would be fine. Um, however, whatever you will leave close by will be damaged. And we know that because uh, after some very large digging in the literature, they kind of mention something like that uh, in a couple of different uh, papers. So how the uh, trees died? Uh, well, first of all, they were hit by an asteroid. They were damaged. We know that because uh, one of the impact craters was studied very uh, soon after its formation, Sikhota Alin uh, in Russia, uh, 49, 47. 
and then parts of those uh, as parts of those trees have been uh, mixed with the uh, proximal ejecta blanket and just uh, kind of slowly cooked inside. If you have listened to me, right now you can explain what's wrong with this <laughs> movie. <laughs> Any ideas? You know, if it's the comet or us, actually the comet was, was better choice than an asteroid because comet would be quicker or faster than an asteroid but the second thing absolutely true they i think that they said that it was about six seven kilometers uh, in diameter the asteroid uh, and even assuming that the, it would be a cometary body moving quite much quicker let's say 50 kilometers per second it would still not make a planetary destruction so if anything like that happens to you and you for example are now are multi-billionaire or something do not invest in spaceship that will take you to the uh, you know other planet that may be very dangerous <laughs> just build a, a proper um, a protection home digged into a geologically stable area so you would be much better uh, with that so uh, otherwise, I, I really enjoyed this rock, uh, this movie, but but it, this part really irritated me. So very quickly, in case you would like to avoid uh, dying, there there are ways uh, for that. So first of all, we need to know what is uh, potentially there in order to do something about that. Uh, you can see here the, the number, the movie that is showing the number of uh, potentially dangerous uh, asteroids. But uh, the point is that there is, until very recently, we didn't know about most of the asteroids that uh, are um, potentially dangerous to us. But right now the number is growing right now. As for a couple of days ago, two days ago, three days ago, uh, we known uh, slightly less than 30,000 uh, asteroids. Uh, but th there are good and bad news on this slide. The good news is that most of the large asteroids, like 99% of large asteroids that can potentially, you know, be the chick loop sized asteroids, larger than one kilometer. So ones that can cause global or regional damage, we know about them. You can see that the, the number of those asteroids is not increasing. We are relatively safe from them. However, the smaller asteroids that can still be pretty dangerous, you, you remember the, uh, the asteroid that did this uh, large uh, 1.3 kilometers in diameter crater in uh, Arizona was 50 meters in diameter, like most of them, we don't know about. And the number of them is growing very quickly, but still we have a lot uh, to, to learn about. Uh, and so just, you know, if you want to have some excitement in your life, you can check up the uh, information about what, what's there flying around us today. Very good web page. I, I strongly recommend checking it out. Uh, so today we have quite a lot of asteroids, as you can see. All of them are were flying uh, by us uh, today, and uh, even one of them was flying very close by because it was flying closer than the distance between Earth and the Moon. So, yay! But missed us, so we should not worry about that. And you can see that uh, you know that there is nothing really large planned for us uh, within the next couple of days. The the larger one, the largest one, uh, I think is uh, estimated from 30 to 70 uh, meters in diameter. So again, potentially it could make the Barringer crater sized hole, but it will miss us. Don't worry about that. Or already, well, this one will miss us. Why do you think there is? You know, th there's a very exact number for the velocity, but there's a very large difference in size for the size of the impactor. Any ideas why is that? The, so the size of the impactor here, the, the largest one nearby, is from about 30 to uh, 80, 90 uh, meters, which means, yes, if the asteroid is dark, it means that it can be quite large before we'll see it on the on the dark uh, sky. The asteroids are extremely small, and you know they can be seen only in a specific kind of. Uh, they, they don't. 
they are not like stars. They do not shine by themselves. So they are much uh, harder to see. And uh, depending on their albedo, they may be easier or harder to see. So those are actually the ones that we should worry about, but we should not worry too much. This is the list of asteroids that can actually potentially hit us. So here is the uh, the one that is uh, predicted uh, to potentially hit us uh, in about uh, 100, 200 years, more or less. Uh, but the chance are, is, is extremely small. So uh, do not worry about that. It's one in uh, one about 2000 uh, that it will not hit us. Uh, however, it's not impossible. Uh, and this is why we should we should keep an eye on those uh, fig features and uh, yeah check out if they are there. Uh, we, there's a couple of things that we can actually do in order to avoid that. First one is obviously just kick it uh, to a different location by, for example, exploding atomic bomb. Where have we heard about that? Yay, <laughs> Hollywood. But it's an option. It's a very bad option. It's the worst option possible because it's a slight, it's a really, really unpredictable uh, plan. So, so let's avoid doing that. Much better idea would be to send to the uh, asteroid uh, a brave group of uh, painters uh, to repaint our asteroid. Because if we know about the the danger uh, in many, many years, many tens of hundreds of years in advance, even repainting the asteroid would change the um, the, the way, uh, the orbit of the asteroid and help us to avoid the danger uh, in a very, very predictable, uh, very self, uh, safe way. And the third option is to kind of kick it by either slowly moving it by a small rocket or just uh, kind of kick it, but with a smaller, um, um, smaller and more predictable, uh, in a small, pro more predictable way. And if you don't know it, now you will. There's an amazing mission uh, that is called the DART that will be doing exactly that this fall. Uh, this fall, there will be a first uh, test of uh, redirection of an asteroid. Uh, the, aster the, the mission is already on its way. It's going to a double asteroid, so an asteroid with, e with a moon, a small asteroid going around it, and it will impact the smaller asteroid to check if we can predictably change the, the way in which this system is moving. They are not right now trying to reach us, but you know, we could use the same uh, method in the past to, to save ourselves. On the less optimistic way, like way of thinking about that, we can also use this method to actually put something uh, to hit us. So, you know, space uh, terrorism will probably be an option after this fall. So, yay, another end of the world. Uh, here are some of the papers that I suggest to read uh, if you are interested in the topic and if you have any questions I will be very happy to try to answer to them uh, and you can also, also uh, talk to me uh, later on. Thank you.